Hello, my name is Art Koenig and I'd like to talk to you today about production process optimization in the geotechnical lab. Now production process optimization has at its very foundation uh, several business corollaries, the first of which is this one. Because I don't make any money until I turn the work out the door. This corollary was transmitted to me by an architect uh, in 1984 when I asked him why he uses a pen registered mylar uh, for his uh, drawings instead of the traditional vellum. The second business corollary is that uh, I make more money paying other people to do the work than I make by doing it myself. In a lot of cases in the engineering industry there are certain types of activities that are farmed out to other service providers. For example, we're all familiar with uh, contract drillers uh, that do our geotechnical drilling for us. Some other firms farm out even testing work and they just concentrate on the strict geotechnical design work. But uh, this is an important corollary to remember too because it can lead to increased profits and uh, production process optimization. The third corollary, and I'll let you read it here, um, basically says that uh, engineering in today's market is pretty much a commoditized activity. Uh, there's a lot of service providers. Everybody uh, pretty much does the same thing, at least in the eyes of your clients. Uh, you do pretty much the same thing. And that the thing that's going to differentiate uh, one company from another is their product delivery systems and the business ecosystem that delivers their projects. A product delivery system is basically the mechanics of how you actually produce your work product and deliver your product to uh, to the person that's paying your uh, paying your invoice. Um, and the business ecosystem, what that means is all the relationships of uh, of people that work in your industry to help. Uh, get the industry where it's going. This consists of bankers, accountants, lawyers, contractors, uh, everybody that you come in contact with uh, in your business is considered uh, part of the business ecosystem. Turning now to the major areas of uh, production in the traditional geotechnical firm, we have starting uh, at the top of the uh, page uh, the field operations followed by the lab operations uh, going around clockwise and uh, then down at the bottom we have the engineering ops and then admin. Field operations uh, consists of things uh, generally the drilling, the drilling function and all other field activities associated with getting the, getting the jobs drilled. Uh, lab operations, another way to think of that is to uh, consider that uh, that is the testing operations. Once the, uh, the site is drilled the soil obviously comes into the lab uh, lab testing is assigned and then the laboratory technicians uh, test uh, test the soil and uh, report the results. The results are reported generally to the engineering operations um, down at the bottom and um, that's where the report and the design uh, function is generally done. And of course another uh, production center uh, is the admin when that generally handles invoicing uh, buildings uh, and grounds, maintenance, insurance, um, accounting, all other kinds of things. I'd like to drill down now a little bit uh, further into the uh, operations, uh, the production processes that go on in the geotechnical lab itself. We have, for example, the intake layout phase of the samples when they come in, uh, followed by test assignment uh, of the samples and then the sample segregation and distribution where of course we um, distribute the samples to uh, the various uh, piles of soil that are going to have various testing uh, procedures run on them and then of course uh, the lab has to do sample preparation and then they do their uh, testing activity uh, where they uh, actually cut the samples or uh, weigh them or bake them uh, put them on the scale, weigh them, then put them in the oven uh, dry them out, uh, bring them back out and weigh them again. And then of course the uh, next thing is reduction of data. So we have a whole bunch of activities that take place in the geotechnical testing lab uh, that culminate uh, eventually in getting the uh, information to the engineers. And what I'd like to talk to and uh, concentrate on now is uh, production processes uh, associated with uh, collecting the test data and the reduction of that data. Essentially uh, what we have now is a uh, uh, system in place where there's a lot of manual activity uh, that goes on. Many of you 
probably see this in your laboratories when you uh, when you walk down uh, to make your rounds. Uh, the engineer technician is uh, putting samples on uh, scales, uh, uh, recording the information on paper, uh, and collecting it into um, data uh, forms, uh, and then uh, reducing the data to get it into a form uh, where the engineer can use it. Now it's in the area of the collection of the lab data and its reduction into a form which is uh, suitable for use uh, by your uh, boring software programs such as Gantt or Excel or some of the other programs that you may use that we've discovered a real production gremlin. This production gremlin in the lab is uh, lab paperwork and all of the uh, activities that are required to uh, create it. Ah uh, yes, lab paperwork. Uh, here's an example of uh, some lab paperwork up in the upper left right-hand corner um, of the screen you see the uh, lab tech uh, dutifully uh, calculating results off of his uh, lab data sheet on which he's uh, manually entered uh, all of the data elements. In the middle of the screen uh, is the actual data sheet itself, in this case uh, from Superfly Testing Lab, and uh, this sheet is for the liquid and plastic limit uh, tests on, uh, on a sample. I'd like to talk uh, a bit about the uh, the various areas of this uh, testing sheet that uh, require data entry, uh, starting uh, with the project and the client and the material. The uh, lab tech uh, generally fills this information out by hand and uh, also in the material section uh, indicates uh, the kind of material that, uh, that the test is being uh, performed upon. And when I say kind of material, I mean a sandy material or a clay material, material or a light gray or a dark gray. Uh, material. Uh, the uh, the next area that the uh, lab tech will uh, deal with is the uh, actual information concerning the uh, the pan numbers and the tear numbers and the dry weights and the wet weights and all that uh, that kind of stuff. And then of course uh, we have some data reduction uh, that's uh, done by hand uh, by the lab tech where he actually uh, runs the computations. In some cases, of course, in some labs, uh, this data this uh, uh, procedure is done uh, by uh, some other software, uh, for example, uh, Gantt or Excel, and uh, and that helps lab tech out to some degree. Although in some labs uh, we still find them uh, hand calculating some test results, uh, even if they do use uh, even if they do use Gantt. At any rate, uh, shown there in the uh, in the purple is the uh, information uh, which is. Uh, required to be filled out by the lab tech for just one uh, test on one particular specimen, in this case a liquid limit test. And the number 12 indicates the number of data elements that the lab tech uh, has to fill out in order to get all of this information for uh, that particular specimen for that one test. Over here at the right hand side uh, is the uh, area where the uh, technician will uh, input his data, uh, collected it by hand uh, onto the paper form for the plastic limit. Uh, in this case, uh, to do one plastic limit, uh, a two-point plastic or a two-trial plastic limit, uh, the lab tech uh, has to um, record by hand uh, 18 uh, data elements. So all in all, in order to get a uh, Atterberg limit uh, on this particular specimen, this one specimen, the uh, lab tech has to uh, manipulate uh, with a pencil and paper uh, 30 uh, d data elements in addition to uh, the filling out of the project number and the client and uh, that sort of thing. And it's important to keep in mind that this is for just one specimen. On a job where you have 90 specimens, uh, you can see that uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of manual uh, paperwork filling out activities that, uh, that go on. Another area where the uh, lab technician has to spend a lot of time uh, writing lab paperwork uh, uh, data is uh, when uh, they uh, create the uh, tracking tags for uh, the Atterberg limit testing and the minus 200 testing and perhaps the unit dry weight testing. Uh, essentially what happens is in the lab the soil samples have to be split uh, to be sent to s different stations for the different uh, different types of tests and of course once the sample uh, is split up you have to remember what boring it came from and what depth uh, it came from and that sort of thing. For example over here on the left hand side we see a what we call a tracking tag for the uh, uh, minus 200 testing that uh, shows the top the project number and then the boring number and the depth zone and then the individual test that's going to be run. So that's one asp another aspect of the uh, paperwork uh, that needs to be um, 
that needs to be processed and created even before they uh, actually start putting things on the scale and doing the weighing and, and the uh, recording. So after the data is recorded, there's, of course, even more lab paperwork. Uh, this can represent a lab tech uh, manager or lab manager. It can even represent a project engineer uh, going back and wondering, uh, uh, was that number supposed to be a 23 or was that number supposed to be a 32? Uh, remembering that a lot of that data is hand uh, handwritten, um, there is a lot of opportunity for uh, engineers to uh, wonder why they uh, left that job at AIG. So then let's talk about the lab data paperwork cycle. Uh, shown here is the uh, individual um, steps that each one of the data elements um, has to transit through uh, on the way to the paper. Uh, first, uh, a material a sample is put on a scale, and uh, the scale has to take a reading. Uh, the next thing that happens is the technician has to physically look at that reading. Um, and then uh, process it into the brain down there at the bottom. Then the brain has got to activate the hand and move the hand over to the paper and then uh, cause the paper to write the information down, hopefully in the right uh, cell uh, location on the paper and hopefully without uh, a transposition or transcription error. Uh, this cycle goes on and on for each one of the data elements, uh, and starting back with the scale to the eye, to the brain, to the hand, to the paper. Um, now, psychologically, this is a, has an interesting um, a feature to it because each one of these processes is uh, done in a separate area of the brain, and uh, the brain has to actually switch, uh, basically switch gears uh, in order to activate the, deactivate the various processing centers to, uh, to do this stuff. So it's no wonder why, uh, that uh, there's transcription errors and, uh, and that sort of thing in the lab because uh, the brain has to manipulate a lot of data. Here's a representation of um, what has to happen, the cycle, just to get the first data element, say the uh, weight of a tear. Uh, just to record that on paper, uh, the technician's brain has got to go through five uh, separate and distinct um, uh, activities. And of course, that happens uh, with uh, data element number two, data element three, and so on and so on. The thing that eventually results is a sheet, uh, a sheaf of papers uh, that has the lab information on it. Uh, sometimes it's filled out great, sometimes it's not filled out uh, so great. And then though that information is then uh, given to uh, somebody else to post-process. The uh, lab papers uh, can have transcription error. Uh, it's also messy and also it takes uh, a lot of time to do and we'll go into that a little bit more later. So that's not all of the lab uh, data and the paperwork cycle. The full cycle uh, looks something like this. We have over here on the left-hand side the what we've previously seen, and I call that the test bench. That's the, the, the guy actually putting the, uh, uh, the sample on the scale uh, to uh, once he's finished with his uh, information and doing his stuff, he takes that uh, sheaf of papers and then it goes over to the what I call the boring log data entry uh, process of the firm. Uh, that information, uh, paperwork, is generally given to a person like this. Uh, we call this person the data entry clerk or the GINT uh, data operator. Uh, and this person is responsible for uh, putting the information into uh, some kind of a, a format uh, that can be processed into the engineering report. Uh, this poor person uh, has to go through the same type of uh, cycle for each one of the data elements uh, that, uh, that they manipulate. In this case, they start with the paper, uh, the stack of papers uh, that the lab tech gives them. And the data elements have to go off the paper to the eye and then to the person's brain, and then to the fingers to do the typing. Uh, and the typing is done on a keyboard into Gint or Excel or, or something, like, uh, something like that. Uh, and then the person's eye, the operator's eye, has to uh, go back to the paper, uh, goes into the eye, then the brain, the fingers, and, and Gint. And this happens, of course, over and over again uh, all throughout the day. Uh, this is basically what it looks like, everybody going crazy trying to uh, handle the data uh, in the lab. Eventually uh, what happens is that a, a boring log uh, software is used to uh, uh, use the data to present a, 
uh, create a boring log for the engineer. Uh, usually this is Ghent or Excel. And so the final output uh, after all of these uh, uh, transits of uh, data elements through the various uh, sets of eyeballs and hands and paper and hands and eyeballs and computers and that sort of thing is a uh, boring log. So uh, the cost of all this. Um, as you can imagine, it takes quite a bit of time. Uh, what we found is that in a production lab uh, that's running, say, uh, uh, sampling on, uh, testing on 90 samples a day, uh, that, that the number of data elements uh, will reach anywhere from five to 600 uh, uh, data elements that have to be manipulated uh, each day in the, just a, a normal lab production. Uh, this time uh, is, takes about four hours a day just to do the paperwork. Um, we know because we've actually timed it. Uh, timed the individual operations and added them up. Um, and the cycle cost uh, for this kind of uh, work is about $26,000 a year. One thing is important to realize, I think, is that the $8 an hour guy in the lab isn't an $8 an hour guy. Uh, he's probably a uh, $20 an hour person, if not more, when you consider all of his benefits, all of the um, things that you have to do to administrate uh, administrate that employee. It may even be more depending on uh, you know what region of the country you're in. And of course another cost is uh, this aggravates the bejesus out of people. Uh, one of the big aggravations is that the uh, busted, busted lab tests uh, and of course once you have a, a transcription error um, you find that out about a week after the lab uh, actually started doing the work and of course all the samples have been uh, have been thrown out and so you have to do retests and things. So let's take a, a look here at uh, the lab testing technician. Uh, Going to take a little break here mentally uh, and switch to something different but this is basically uh, the amount of testing load and data load that your poor lab technician has to handle over and over each day and uh, as we can imagine it gets uh, pretty pretty tiring. So then recognizing the uh, work that the lab testing technician has to do in order to uh, get the report uh, data uh, collected uh, and into the hands of the engineer uh, we started uh, making some connections. Uh, we figured that uh, we could take one of these guys, maybe uh, hook him up with a scale, maybe kind of hook that scale into a computer, and maybe get that computer linked into uh, a Gint or Excel or whatever uh, boring log software people were, uh, were using. The whole idea was to draw lines between all these two and wire them together, uh, thinking that uh, if we could maybe do that, we could uh, eliminate uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the paperwork. So uh, XGEL Data Systems embarked on a development uh, project to uh, well, what we call the XGEL Initiative. Um, XGEL stands for Experimental Geotechnical Engineering Laboratory. And um, we started uh, evaluating what procedures uh, uh, were amenable to uh, production process optimization uh, through the use of uh, software and computers and the electronic scales. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, uh, just the process. Um, first thing we had to do, of course, is staff up. Um, and uh, there were certain things that you were going to need if you're staffing up a, a project like this. Um, first, you need a software architect. Um, that's a guy, a software architect uh, is uh, a fellow that does uh, the crowd control, uh, coding, process architecture, and vision control. Uh, when I say crowd control, uh, what I mean is uh, that uh, software is uh, almost like uh, herding cats. Um, and you have to uh, put the different color cats in the different areas of the, uh, uh, of the room, uh, lest they uh, fight with each other. Um, and so a good software architect makes sure that your code doesn't uh, miscommunicate with itself. This is different than bugs uh, and bug fixes and that sort of thing. Of course, a software architect, some of them can also code, uh, but uh, a good architect is uh, very valuable when it comes to the process architecture and the vision control. Uh, bottom line is there's a lot of stuff that goes on underneath the hood for a software program to make sure it works right. 
um, and the general rule of thumb is that if it took, takes three seconds to do on the screen, uh, it took three months to code it. Next thing you need, of course, uh, in any kind of development activity uh, or for a business to develop something is a guy to write the checks. Um, guy that writes the checks is the, also the fellow that uh, in our in our company, uh, me, I guess, <laughs> that uh, I provide the uh, vision, uh, the uh, process architecture, coding, and some crowd control. And you notice here how these uh, activities of these two individuals are complementary. Uh, vision is the first uh, attribute of the guy that writes the checks, the entrepreneur. Um, the uh, but it's the uh, last one on the software architects uh, list of things. Uh, process architecture, uh, the production process that's important uh, for the uh, for the software developer, uh, and uh, of course for the software architect himself that's kind of in the middle also. And of course, as a software developer on the right hand side, we don't care at all about crowd control. Uh, we don't uh, as long as it works. Uh, we, we're, we're happy, which is, of course, a wrong way to do things. And, of course, the software architect, the guy over at the right, is always uh, telling you that, too. And, of course, as you can imagine, because of these conflicting uh, but complementary um, uh, positions, uh, you need a helper. Well, the helper does the uh, stress relief and the dispute resolution and a little bit of coding, too. So, uh, with existing process architecture, uh, one of the things that, uh, that we had to do as a company uh, before we started coding is, uh, is go in and determine what it was that the various laboratories uh, were doing and what the what actual process steps the lab technicians uh, actually went through in order to do their work. And uh, that was a real eye-opener for us. Um, and uh, uh, we learned a lot of things uh, by asking certain questions. Um, some of them were, uh, what do they do? Uh, how do they do it? Why do they do it? Why do they do it that way? Uh, is it needed? Who does it? And do they like doing it? And what do they want in a, uh, any kind of software production process automation uh, scheme? Uh, each individual uh, and each individual lab uh, probably has different uh, ideas about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. But uh, you can get some general grouping of activities uh, that are consistent uh, among the labs. And you use that to determine what, uh, what kind of code elements and modules and, uh, and what the various crowds are, basically, that you have to control. The next thing that happens is uh, you work into coding and the code architecture. This is just an example of, um, of a, a code sheet uh, with all that uh, gobbledygook geek stuff uh, in the middle uh, that, uh, that tells the software program how to do what it does. And uh, one thing about the software that uh, we found out very soon is that, uh, uh, the, that software um, is unforgiving. Um, and uh, that unforgivingness really points out the wonderful ability of the human brain to deal with ambiguity. But uh, once you start understanding the architecture of what the processes are, uh, you can code to um, uh, cover those kinds of uh, those kinds of processes. Uh, this is just an example of the kinds of things that your coders have to go through. It just doesn't happen on the screen. I guess that's what I'm trying to uh, to show. After the code is written, uh, we did beta testing. Um, and and uh, one of the things that you have to have with uh, beta testing is, uh, is a good beta tester. Uh, this is the first beta tester. He was also an alpha tester uh, of one of the smaller uh, labs in San Antonio. They were small at the time. They've uh, grown from three people to 17 people in the time they've had the, uh, the XGEL software. Uh, this fellow was uh, one of the business owners. Um, and uh, he was intimately involved with uh, uh, understanding what goes on in the lab because he walked through the lab every day on the way to his uh, desk. After you do some uh, beta testing, of course, uh, there's all kinds of bugs that come up. Um, you have to do bug killing and fire containment um, to, uh, to get things working right. And then uh, these are the results. Um, we uh, came up with a, uh, a software uh, 
package uh, that consists of various uh, screens which uh, uh, allow the uh, operator of the system to automatically collect the data directly off of the electronic scale into a basic project management system that is not meant to replace uh, any of the existing uh, project management systems in place at any of the labs. Uh, it's also not meant to replace Ghent. Uh, it's also not meant to replace uh, uh, really the activities of the uh, geotechnical lab manager uh, except those activities he just really hates doing. Um, this screen, for example, is showing the project access screen. Uh, you can see over at the left hand side are the various project numbers um, and the system of course knows when the project was created because uh, it's it, it has a date time stamp on it and also you can mark uh, when the project One of the other screens that we have is the uh, boring geometry screen. Uh, that's the screen where uh, over on the right left hand, I'm sorry, the left hand side, you indicate what borings uh, you have in their various depths. And over on the right hand side, you assign the samples. Once the uh, project number and the boring numbers and the sample zones are determined, uh, that sets the geometry for the, uh, for the job itself. There's another geometry that comes later, and that's the testing geometry. And once the testing geometry or test assignments are done, then the software knows uh, what kind of electronic data forms uh, it's supposed to provide to the user uh, so that he can uh, begin automatically collecting his data. This is an example of the test assignment screen. Uh, the user can just go in and click uh, any one of the cells, uh, and it'll, uh, it'll turn turn yellow and then turn green, uh, indicating that a, a test is locked in uh, for, um, for the system to uh, automatically create the electronic data forms. Uh, the system, uh, remember those cards that we talked about, um, those cards that follow along with the uh, liquid limit and the plastic limit or the minus 200s, uh, those can be automatically generated because once you assign the tests, the uh, software, of course, uh, knows uh, that uh, there's a tracking card that needs to be generated and it will automatically generate uh, a tracking card for you. Uh, the system uh, software can also print the tests, the test assignments uh, after they're logged in. Uh, that's a big help uh, for the uh, lab tester because although this is an electronic system, uh, there still is paper that's used uh, to, um, to make the system work uh, even better. talk about that test assignment screen. Um, what we see uh, is the test assignments up top and down at the bottom here in green uh, we see these things called MC, UDW, uh, liquid limit, plastic limit, uh, minus 200. Um, what we find is that uh, uh, these tests uh, are what we call the big five uh, and we call them the big five because these five tests represent about 80 to 90 percent of the total testing load that is done in a traditional geotechnical lab. Yes, there's some unconfines. Yes, there's some swell tests. Yes, there's some triaxials. Yes, there's permeabilities and stuff like that. But for the day in, day out stuff of a traditional geotechnical production lab, uh, these represent most of the testing that uh, is turned out, turned out the door. And of course, that is what we wanted to concentrate on. Uh, is to optimize the things where you could get the most bang for your buck. This is an example of the mo electronic data form uh, for the moisture content. Uh, as you can see over there on the right hand side, um, that 19.67, uh, that's a weight that is coming in electronically from uh, an O-house scale. And that data is being automatically placed in that uh, in that data grid cell up there under the dry weight and once that communication is made which takes about oh, two to three seconds after the weight is put on the scale the system updates and computes the moisture content so there's no there's no handwriting at all of uh, of the weights nor of the tears or the tear weights there's automatic ways within this software to uh, keep people from having to uh, write those things down on paper uh, also. 
the next sheet is a sheet showing what we call the soil description screen, um, not to be confused with the uh, uh, with the lithology uh, or the engineer's description. Um, this is just uh, a sheet that can be used by the lab technician to indicate what the sample looked like to him when he was testing it. Now, in some firms, a uh, good lab technician uh, is uh, given license to go ahead and classify the soils or not classify them to describe them more fully. And of course, uh, this allows a, a person to do this simply by touching buttons, just like you order a uh, triple grande vanilla latte at Starbucks and they punch it into their touch screen um, or click some buttons on their computer. You can do the same thing, uh, same thing here. For example, you can hit dark, gray, and clay uh, off the keyboard over to the right, and uh, it'll put it into the, into the proper cell. Uh, over on the left. This is an example of the test results and the export screen. Um, uh, you can at any time uh, with, with this software, uh, the lab tech can get a, uh, a feel for how the lab testing is uh, progressing. Uh, if there's a number uh, in the grid, um, then that indicates the test is complete. If it says NA, that means the testing has been assigned but the, uh, all of the data has not been collected yet. And of course, if the cell is blank, that means no testing was assigned for that particular uh, uh, test. Uh, you have the ability to print the data. Uh, so the lab tech, at any time during the testing process, whenever he wants it or the engineer wants it or anybody wants it, they can just print intermediate test results. Um, and also the, uh, the software um, has the ability to export uh, the data uh, directly into a GENT file or an Excel file, which can be uh, opened up in GENT or opened up in Excel or, or imported into those uh, software packages. Once the data is uh, collected and then exported, uh, then uh, the GENT operator. Remember all of that typing and all that manipulation the GENT operator had to do that we showed on the previous screens? Well, that's a thing of the past now because you can simply uh, go into GENT um, and, uh, and import it uh, directly from the NextGel uh, data file. Takes about mm, two minutes at the most for a GENT operator to import, um, you know, a, 50-hole job or a 2-hole job or a 100-hole job. No typing at all because the data has already been electronically captured. A nice thing about GENT is that it has the ability to manipulate the raw data and do the calculations also. Uh, and some firms do that. The XGEL system calculations are just used internally into the lab just as, uh, as a supplemental check. And of course, GENT can be set up to just take the actual results from the lab made and bring, bring them directly into GENT without using the GENT calculation routine. The uh, XGEL software can also export directly to a, an Excel sheet with all the raw data and stuff like that so that the engineers can manipulate to their heart's content. So, talk a little bit about the production placement of, uh, of the XGEL. Previously, we talked about what we came up with, and uh, we had to then go to the production placement uh, phase of our development process. We uh, have uh, several labs. Some of the lab testers and lab techs up there uh, are shown uh, with their XGEL lab mate station uh, up there at the top. That's one of the GENT operators. Uh, she's smiling because she just clicks a couple of buttons, and the data uh, is automatically imported into her uh, her Ghent project. Uh, down at the lower left, uh, we have an engineer who has a pretty clean desk because uh, he's really not worrying too much anymore about the, uh, the data mistakes and that sort of thing. I'd like to talk now about the time savings or the cost savings. The uh, over on the left of this screen is the various uh, items that are uh, required in the development or the uh, production of the lab testing for uh, one of these jobs. We took uh, two jobs uh, that consisted of, uh, of 90 
samples that needed to be tested, about 45 for each one of them. And we show here on the, on the, under the current time taken area what time is allotted for each one of these steps under the current way of doing things. Uh, for example, up there at the top we have the 90 soil description write-ins at 5 seconds uh, equals about 8 minutes and uh, with the X-Gel that takes about uh, four minutes to do. If you follow along down the, down the way, you find that uh, there's a lot of time taken up, about 40 minutes uh, is taken up on a, on a job, uh, actually pre-preparing the paperwork before any testing is done. There's also a lot of uh, time that's taken to input the data uh, into Ghent uh, and look at, the, look at the data, make sure it's right, that it's gone into the right place. And then, of course, there's uh, a data checking and that sort of thing. So, actually, under the current uh, way of doing things for this this example job, the process is takes about 103. I mean, 203 minutes. With the XGEL, that entire process is 35 is 35 minutes. So you save uh, almost two hours on this 90 sample uh, production job. Uh, you'll save about two hours of technician time and a whole bunch of hassle. So, remembering back to our thing that we started this whole presentation with, the production process and the corollaries. Here they are again, and just to recap that this is all important because the f you don't make any money until you turn the work out the door. And the fastest you, faster you can turn it out, the more money you can make. Also, you know, it's important because you can make more, more money by paying other people to do the work than you can make doing it yourself. Believe me when I tell you you're not making uh, as much money as you can when your lab testers are having to manually uh, process all of their data. If uh, you, you get some kind of a software package that relieves them of that ability and you invest in some electronic scales, uh, that'll really put you ahead of the game. The third reason it's important is because of the engineering being a, um, a pretty tight market and a pretty competitive market these days. And so anything you can do to uh, speed up your product delivery system uh, and to work with your ecosystem uh, uh, partners uh, to deliver your projects faster uh, and more accurately, uh, you'll be uh, way, uh, way ahead of the game compared to people that don't. And of course, Production equals profit. That's what it all boils down to. The f the better production process optimization you have, uh, the more profit uh, the more profit you can make. You make profit not only by saving money uh, in your in your expenses and things, but you make more profit because that time that you've been able to save has allowed your people to do some additional jobs. So, in summary, kind of starting from those top things, you have commoditized service awareness, outsourcing, business ecosystems, going down into product deliveries and optimized production with electronic data capture. All that filters down into uh, profit and growth. And uh, for a lot of firms, uh, that's, uh, that's where they want to be. That's the sweet, sweet spot to get all that working together right for profit and growth. Well, Thank you very much for attending the presentation today. Uh, I've had a fun time uh, talking with you about uh, what we went through uh, to develop the XGEL LabMate system and to uh, talk about uh, the exciting things that uh, are available now for your lab testing technicians and the engineers to, uh, to get their projects out the door uh, faster. So uh, if there's any questions, uh, we can answer those. If we're on a webinar, I think there's a way that we can type in questions or maybe the moderator will show those on my screen or something like that and uh, I can uh, switch over and, uh, and answer them. And of course, uh, just a little light humor here, yeah, but I still want a talking frog. So uh, once again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, look forward to uh, hearing uh, from you, and uh, if there's any questions, uh, phone numbers at the bottom, and of course uh, you can go to the lab, uh, the website uh, uh, for uh, our company.